Can I, I would, I'd like to make a motion that we move up the waste free Greenwich report for next, as there are very patient community members here who have young children probably to go back to. Andy, right? That's okay. I mean, Andy Bermonti's waiting, but that's okay. He's, he's asleep, I'm sure. That's fine. That's fine with me. Are you guys with that? Okay with that? Can we uh, to get a second for that? Second. Okay. All in favor of moving waste free Greenwich up? Okay. That passes. Okay, good idea. I'm um, sorry, Andy. Um, Ms. Hartopoulos, Mr. Shamps. Oh my gosh, I don't know what we did to deserve this, but thank you. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So, um, first, we want to just start off by quickly introducing ourselves. So I'm Angie Hardafillis, and I'm the PTAC Green, Green Chairs co-chair. <laughs> and I'm here tonight with Julie Deschamps uh, of Waste Free Greenwich. We're thankful for the opportunity to present and be on the agenda. This is like 10 years in the making for our group. Um, so thank you so much. And a super thank you actually for Dr. Jones and Dan Watson. They met with us yesterday um, and we got to have a like 45 minutes with them during one of the craziest times of the year. So thank you for carving that time out for us. Okay, we're ready to go. All right, Greenwich Public Schools is the town's largest institution and continues contributes significantly to the municipal waste, system, waste stream. But a large percentage of waste generated in schools can be reduced, recycled, composted, or replaced with sustainable products, resulting in fiscal savings, environmental benefits, and educational opportunities. The Zero Waste Schools proposal before you provides a blueprint toward a more sustainable future at Greenwich Public Schools and a solution to the rising cost of waste disposal and its negative impact during a waste crisis in our state. Um, next, oh wait, he, okay, we're already on the next slide. Okay, <laughs> um, should I just say next when it's time to go? Okay, great. The Zero Waste Schools program was crafted by members of the PTAC Green Schools Committee, the Greenwich Sustainability Committee, Greenwich Recycling Advisory Board, and Waste Free Greenwich for your consideration. And it's endorsed by the Town's Conservation Commission, Sustainability Committee, and the Department of Public Works. The proposal is based on over a decade of experience with waste reduction education in our schools. Consultations with districts with successful programs like Westport, Scarsdale, West Hartford and Wilton, on which our proposal is based, and extensive research on best practices and case studies of waste reduction in our schools. Further, it expands existing district procedures regarding recycling. Uh, next, please. As we emerge from the pandemic and a plan for the coming school year, the district has the opportunity and responsibility to implement more sustainable waste practices and policies to create a resilient system using an integrated approach, both bottom up and top down. The zero waste school proposal focuses on three main priorities to be implemented during the 22-23 school year and beyond. First, reinstate recycling in school buildings. Second, implement the cafeteria waste reduction program district-wide, and third, food scrap reduction and recycling. It also includes long-term goals like reusable food service wear systems with dishwashers and more sustainable purchasing for future implementation. Next slide, please. The first priority is to reinstate recycling in all district schools, ideally before the end of this school year. District Procedure E-051.35, approved by the Board of Ed over 10 years ago, requires schools to follow state and local recycling laws to promote environmentally sound practice and as an educational strategy. However, in a recent survey, only six of 12 reporting schools currently have recycling bins in cafeterias. Recycling education has not been conducted in over two years. The district is not in compliance with state and local laws and its own codified procedures. Effective waste diversion requires more than putting out bins. When oversight and education fall by the wayside, best practices are not followed and contamination increases, as seen here. Consistent, frequent education and training in the cafeteria and classrooms are just as important. Next slide, please. Successful programs require purposeful strategies, including working with stakeholders and providing guidance on how to participate. 
According to district procedure, the responsibility of recycling and waste reduction requires not only bottom-up involvement, but also top-down commitment from district leaders, principals, and facilities. To this end, the Zero Waste Schools program builds on existing procedure and recommends the formation of a green team at each school to plan and implement strategies, infrastructure, and educational programming. It recommends best practices and training for students and staff, including custodians, to ensure effective and proper recycling in compliance with the law. Next slide, please. The second priority of the Zero Waste Schools program is district-wide implementation of the Cafeteria Waste Reduction Program, which was piloted at the six schools you see here from the spring of 2019 to the spring of 2020, just before COVID. The Waste Reduction Program aimed to decrease lunchroom waste through recycling, liquid collection, and at some schools, composting of fresh produce. Greenwich Recycling Advisory Board funded the new sorting stations, which featured color-coded bins and instructional bilingual posters. To ensure buy-in, a green team meeting was held first to discuss planning and implementation of the program. Green schools reps and lunch monitors then conducted student training in the cafeterias and an instructional PowerPoint presentation was distributed to teachers for use in the classroom. Metrics were tracked and rec recorded to gauge success. Next slide, please. The pilot resulted in a reduction in trash by 55% by weight with an average daily diversion of 61 pounds per school. Liquid collection accounted for nearly half. If the program is implemented just at middle and elementary schools, over 153,000 pounds of trash each year could be avoided and $43,000 over five years saved in tipping fees alone. Contamination in recycling was considerably cut as you can see, and cafeterias were cleaner as a whole. With COVID, this program was abandoned. The sorting stations were put in storage closets and parent volunteers were unable to train or organize the program, highlighting the need for more coordinated approach with principal, teacher, and staff investment, a top-down and bottom-up approach. Even now, only two schools are using the sorting stations. Implementation of the program district-wide is recommended this fall. Next slide, please. Wilton School District performed a waste audit in their upper elementary school with 900 students and found they diverted almost 91% of their waste through liquid collection, recycling, and compost, which accounted for the greatest amount. Greenwich schools could have the same results using the Zero Waste Schools program. Next slide, please. The third priority of the Zero Waste Schools program is the reduction and diversion of food waste through donation, shared tables, and food scrap recycling. Food rescue is one way that Greenwich Public Schools can reduce food waste and support neighbors in need. Laws provide liability protections for donor schools, including those participating in the National School Lunch Program. In Greenwich and Fairfield County, numerous public and independent schools partner with Food Rescue US for food donation. Donating is simple and flexible. Surplus can originate from school kitchens, the cafeteria, or from cleanouts before school vacations. To give you a sense of the tonnage that can be diverted, Westport's Staple High School donated over 18,000 pounds just last year. We can attest that there is an abundance of uneaten food to be donated at our schools as well. Next slide, please. Share tables are stations where students can return uneaten items in compliance with health and safety codes. These items are then available for other children who may want additional servings, either during lunch or after school. Share tables are an excellent way to reduce food waste and help hungry kids get their fill. Share tables are supported by the USDA and the Connecticut Department of Education and are in use in some Greenwich schools already. Next slide, please. Food scrap recycling is another effective strategy to reduce the school's solid waste stream, educate the community about the benefits of composting, and even create a nutrient-rich product for school gardens. With, without food scrap recycling, the trash looks like the bottom image with lots of food waste. Food composes more than 22% of our waste stream in Connecticut and is one of the heaviest components to transport and dispose, a significant expense for our town. 
The Zero Waste Schools Program recommends a contracted organics hauler, an approach used at many area schools. If best practices are followed, this is a successful strategy in diverting all food scraps, not just fresh produce, in addition to some compostable materials, including the molded fiber cafeteria trays and napkins. The proposal recommends that an organics hauling be piloted at the Title I schools that lack outdoor composting bins. The estimated cost is three to $4,000 per school annually and grants are available for the pilot. Next slide, please. Although considerable invest, investment, $22,000 in grants has been made in the out, in, on, on the on-site composting bins, there are significant barriers and limitations to this system, such as the custodial union contract and diversion of only fresh produce. On the other hand, organics hauling, hauling is easier, more impactful strategy to divert organics, and this is our recommended strategy. Next slide, please. One of the most successful ways to cut cafeteria waste is the adoption of reusable wares sanitized by dishwashers. Our schools trash half a million trays each year, which are used for mere minutes. They are the single biggest component of trash, as you can see. These trays along with single use disposables are also expensive to purchase about $62,000 each year. And this does not include the considerable costs of hauling and tipping fees. A 2019 pilot using stainless steel trays and a dishwasher at New Lebanon School cut waste by 80%. Six bags of trash was cut to just one for all lunch periods. The superintendent's budget now contains $35,000 for planning a dishwasher at the high school, which is a step in the right direction. Other recommendations for the long-term include sustainable purchasing like condiment pumps instead of packets and encouraging waste-free meals from home. Next slide, please. Local entities can offer support for the planning and implementation of the program. PTAC Green Schools has led recycling training for over a decade in partnership with Grab and Waste Free Greenwich. The Center for Ego Technology also provides free technical assistance to Connecticut schools. This national leader in waste reduction worked with Wilton Public Schools as a case study, which serves as our model. There are also many sources of funding that can be used for toter signage events and a food scrap recycling pilot. We urge the administration to have a collaborative approach and take advantage of the expertise and fiscal assistance available to make the program a success. Next slide, please. We are asking you, the Board of Education, to approve and adopt the Zero Waste Schools program for implementation in the coming school year. The program is a tried and true strategy for schools to cut waste by increasing recycling and minimizing contamination, donating and rescuing surplus food, and composting remaining food scraps. The initiative edu educates our community about the importance of waste reduction for public health environment and our budget. Let's practice what we teach for a more sustainable future in Greenwich. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Um, questions? Yes, Ms. Downey. Um, so so I, Dan is gone, right? Of course he is. Um, just, just to add, talk about how we can, I mean, it seems to me but certainly getting the recycling and the separating of, you know, in the cafeterias, given that we were doing it already. Um, and it sounds like, you know, at Riverside, they were doing it and they're not even one of the six pilot schools. How can we, you know, at least let's, let's think about like what we can do for the fall and, and in stages, Tony, I don't know if you, I mean, maybe it's a Dan question more than a, it's a you question. <laughs> And Dan and I talk together. Okay. I mean, great. we were we had a good conversation, I think, about it yesterday and some of the challenges that we have. Now, what I did after yesterday, I did send a note out because I didn't know actually I didn't remember who the pilot schools were. So I did send a note out to those principals today because you, you have to remember we just reopened most of our cafeterias. Like mm -hmm. literally, we, you know, they were having cafeterias in the gym. So um their intent is to get it reestablished. Um, one or two of them do have some challenges. Um, you know, one of 
them said, even you know, pre-COVID, it was it was challenging because on the day when they didn't have volunteers to help, they didn't have anybody to do it in their building. But they're still going to move in that direction for the fall to reestablish where they were. Um, you know, our middle schools are they're trying to problem solve for next year. But um, one thing that has been great that we learned from COVID was allowing students to eat outside on all those picnic tables. So uh, one of the principals was coming and he's got to resolve that it may be only inside where outside they may not be able to do it because you'd be adding that many more. So they're being very thoughtful about it. And I think that is their intent is to try to reestablish. Then we have a building like New Lebanon, which you saw was great in, in the, the waste reduction, but the actual dishwasher doesn't really do the job, number one. They were finding the trays weren't getting clean enough. And even if they were running them through again, they were having to hand dry them and they didn't have the staff in the, in the kitchen staff to do it. So they had actually stopped right before COVID because we couldn't solve the dishwasher issue. So we may have to put in a brand new dishwasher there that is more of a commercial in nature so that the trays get dry. But so the, the staff, the, the principal team, I think are very committed to doing whatever we can do and everybody understands uh, the importance. And I think that is why we put like the um, dishwasher in for the high school in the budget because that's a third of our district. It really, you know, makes a big difference. So, you know, we're going to do everything that we can. It's just I can't promise that we can stay on this aggressive plan. Um, well, but I think that, but I think there's a happy medium, right? I think you know, I I think we all agree, like the composting and the food scraps is kind of its own anim animal. Pardon the pun. You know, right? there's there's stages to it. There's recycling, you know, separating of garbage in the cafeterias. I mean, do we recycle paper in the classrooms? That's another one. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think there's a number of things we could be doing that we're not. We actually are. And okay. we, we didn't stop that during COVID. But sometimes people will say, well, I saw the custodian dump the recycling just in the trash. Now, what our, what our custodian staff can't do is you go in a classroom and they didn't use the bins appropriately. They're not going to dig in a recycling bin to pull out the trash and separate it. So that ends up going into the trash. So we, the training aspect, I think, is absolutely, we, we haven't done any training in the last two years that that's for sure so i think we can go back over and some of those protocols to help but we've been recycling and i think today the number and i know sean's on i think we've, we've already spent this year about fifty five thousand on recycling um and you know one of the things that happened to us in 1920 that's why it's hard for me to compare costs is if you remember in 1920 right before covid when we were going through the budget um the first selectman increased the tipping fees or, or added tipping fees i don't know if we ever had them um but because i was new but um what happened is those tipping fees basically they were charging the haulers more so it does help the town budget because they're getting those fees for the school district we're like you would be in your home it just increased our tipping fees because the haulers pass that on to everybody else so we're still working through some issues like that too yeah, miss costum so I was on the PTA board at North Street. We tried with our, you know, um, with our cafeteria, we just did not have the volunteer base to keep what was happening going. I mean, if you knew the number of phone calls I got just to help out in the cafeteria when I had, you know, a small baby at home like it, it it's impossible I can't like run to the school cafeteria to remind kids to throw their apples in the right place so I you know if you don't have the volunteer base I just don't know how this gets to the next level and we voted as a PTA to discontinue the food scrap because we just didn't have and the composting, we just didn't have the volunteers. I think the recycling was probably going just fine, but adding that extra layer, which really required supervision and, and volunteer participation, that was a, a hurdle we just couldn't overcome. The other thing is, you know, the share table is a little concerning to me as a food allergy parent, because I don't, I, we were always operated on the assumption that at schools we do not share food because that could be dangerous for children who have allergies. So I, I've never even heard of a share table. Um, I've seen at some supermarkets, you know, they have, you know, fresh fruit and stuff for kids to take if they're hungry, but in a school cafeteria environment, 
I have some questions about the share table, particularly for the young children that are not independent at label reading and they may not even have labels. So um, that sort of concerns me. But I mean, I don't know how we get over the, the hurdle with, with the aspect of composting. That, that's a, a whole other um, hurdle that, you know, unless you have a, a broad base of volunteers and, and what occurs at a lot of schools, and, and I've been through a lot of schools now, um, having lived on the west side of town and, and central Greenwich, is that, you know, some schools have that support and others just, they don't have it. Are we able to answer some of the, yeah, sure. respond to some of the questions? Yeah. Okay, First, great questions. And I think in general, like concerns that a lot of people have are questions kind of right away. I don't know if it's possible to pull back up the last slide from the presentation because sure. that one's Michael, really, in, really important. Actually, I think two things that if we were to highlight two things out of the proposal, because we I know it's a lengthy um, document probably. Actually, you may see very lengthy documents, but, um, but uh, two of the really important things are one, this timeline, and it's laid out a little bit more detail in the actual proposal. This is for visual purposes. Um, and then also laying out the roles and responsibilities of the green team. So in this timeline, we, we didn't feel that this was too aggressive of an approach because basically what we're trying to do is right away just do the things that we had been doing pre-COVID, which were working, um, and then get the other schools, which before before COVID hit us, right? <laughs> that was kind of the hope that we would also be able to get these sorting stations back like into all of the buildings. Um, and I think that some of the concerns about composting and the sorting. One, uh, I totally agree. Like it would, it can take a lot of effort to, if you're sitting there and managing. Part of the reason that the proposal recommends the the hauler is that it's you don't need to manage that. Like that, it all all food, all of the food, even the trays, goes into one bin, and you wheel that like outside, it's a pretty efficient um, system and you don't have to worry about the bins that are outside or the custodial contract or any of any of those things. So just to answer that point so about- So it's an simplicity. additional hiring expense that we'd have to find somebody. Right, so in the, pi in the proposal, the, the pilot is for the, we would wanna run a pilot starting in the, basically in the beginning of um, 2023. And that would be for, doing an organics hauler where we would we are totally willing to write for to get those grants and there are several places that we believe that we can like um it's about three to four thousand dollars um per school to do that and we wanted to do that in our title one schools which bob cheney who was speaking earlier kind of highlighted some of the challenges and almost disadvantages like the title one schools don't even have the compost bins that the the other schools already do have um I also wanted uh, Dr. Jones to uh, address something that you had mentioned. Part of the reason we really are seeking approval for this proposal is that we need this top, we need this top-down approach. Every school operates really differently. It's our hope that Dr. Jones, you'll be able to say principal at a principal's meeting at the beginning of this school year, you know, if this gets approved, principals, we're going to ask everyone this year to form a green team. These are the components of the green team, right? And then it, when we did the pilot, it was just it took one meeting to get everybody off the ground because most of the responsibilities are what people are already doing. I don't know, Julie, if you want to add um, in. I'll just add about share tables. And so there are a, a handful of, of schools that do have share tables already. And I'll, I'll tell you just what I witnessed is that the food gets grabbed up right away. Um, so that I think kids are, are hungry and no, no, and I it may not be safe for no, them. No, no, I, under, I understand the allergy issue, and I a lot of um, principals share that concern. So, another approach is to save it for after school, um, where it can be monitored um, better if there is after school activities, or like even sending the food home to families um, in, where where they're f food insecure. And I know some of the schools do do that. So. You know, there's uh, options for this food. It can also go to Food Rescue US. You save it in the refrigerator, you know, save it in the box and they'll come pick it up. So there's uses for that food other than having, you know, an active share table during the lunch period where there are allergy concerns. And I totally understand that as a parent also with a child with allergies. So, Jim. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have been speaking to Julie for some time now about this. This is an absolute no brainer. We have to 100% embrace this uh, process. And uh, uh, whether it's done on your timeline or we adjust to a timeline that we can accommodate, this has to be done. Archaeologists are going to dig up uh, garbage bags we, we throw away 100 years from now and look and say, are they kidding me? They threw this away. They threw that away. They threw this away. It's ridiculous. We have to move to at least where we were, and, uh, uh, and we have to take this and move forward on it quite aggressively. I suggested, or I, I called Christina today, and we spoke about this. Was it yesterday or today? I don't know. But I think that your uh, your your movement, your campaign, your structure needs one of the Board of Ed members to support you and be your advocate and actually help you get through some things that sometimes uh, are hard to get through uh, from the position you're coming from. So uh, it's a great cause, and I'd certainly uh, uh, would like to consider joining it. I've got a lot of stuff on my plate. So do we all. Uh, uh, it's a great thing I'd certainly like to attach my reputation to and my name to. Uh, if there's somebody else who might have a time and some, uh, some, passionate, uh, some passion for this, uh, we're going to talk amongst ourselves. And if nobody else will be your advocate, I will be your advocate uh, for, this, uh, uh, for getting this done. But I'll get you a definitive answer uh, within a short period of time, call it a week. I'll speak to my, mem my Board of Ed members, co-members, and see if somebody else wants to do it. But if not, I'll do it. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very, very much. much. Karen. So, hi, ladies. Thank you for your presentation. I know I've got to be part of this on the other side uh, from where you were standing. And so, you know, I, I had a question or two for Dr. Jones and then a question or two or comment for you guys. Um, I know that, you know, since the pilots were run prior to COVID, you'd mentioned the tipping fees shouldn't change. So we really haven't been able to see data on the savings, but I would love to be able to sort of see that, you know, it, it, you know, how we might be able to kind of look at that now that things are funding has changed slightly differently and things within our cafeteria and schools have function are function functioning slightly differently uh, since COVID. So I think that that might be um, another piece to this. So um, do we have any data or have we spoken to any, you know, uh, the lunch monitors or uh, other staff members to feel how they, you know, because it, we have to have our lunch monitors be participatory. Um, I know they have a, a long list of responsibilities at the lunch tables, um, you know, how we can sort of help support these initiatives at the least the recycling, you know, even if we build this out in a slightly longer timeline so that we can build support and education for the students so they know they don't need as much monitoring, at least at the older grades. So it sounds very simplistic when we talk about it. And I just, I can't reiterate that enough. We have a building principal, we have a system principal. We've asked for two custodians last year to help even across the district. We couldn't get them, right? So I, I think we have to be realistic about it. We struggle getting people to work for, I don't know how much it is, $12, $14 an hour, maybe, if it's that high as a monitor. And so we have buildings who literally don't have anybody to monitor lunch. So now you're going to add and somebody else that also needs to help. And I'm not saying it can't work. The buildings that have a huge volunteer base and they can manage it, it it's, it's phenomenal. The buildings that have a teacher who doesn't want to stipend, they just love this type of, maybe they run their environmental club and they really embrace it with students. Um, you know, could we look at more student kind of base clubs? It's easier in middle school than it is in elementary, but it's, you literally have to look at every single building because they are all different. They have different resources. Um, and again, it comes down to priorities. It takes money. So I can tell you right now, we're, we're going to have probably more requests for security. You know, we have a, um, we didn't get our cell phone, you know, tower, you know, funded at the high school. It's a huge project that we believe is very important. But again, it's not that, I, I think if you ask our principals, they're all passionate about this and they're gonna, you know, they'll, we'll look at this and they'll do everything that they can. But I think we have to, we have to come, come at it also with a sense of understanding of what, our, what, what they're faced with. And right now we're ha having staffing challenges on top of all of that in the classroom. So that leads me to my question, I think, for our green team here, um, who are dressed for the occasion so lovingly. So <laughs> this is a very aggressive timeline that you guys presented. You know, there's no budget 
numbers in here as to what things might cost, what might not cost. Um, even if we get a grant for the hauler, it may just be a grant for one year, then the cost continues after that for the district. Um, there's, there's different pieces here. And I, you know, I know Joe says he wants to be your advocate and so I'll let him you know, help that. But do you think that this is something that we could work if we start to go backwards a little bit, like at least, I, I remember when we first implemented this, right? And we had the, the bins in the, the lunchroom, you guys made these amazing educational posters that went up to help the students understand. There were photographs of, for instance, like your apple core goes here, right? Like <laughs> it was very simple. It made it easy for uh, kindergartners. They didn't have to look and understand how to read a word. They saw a picture of an apple core. They knew fruit, fruit compost goes in here. You know, if we can take this timeline and I know where everybody wants to have things done overnight and, and I completely understand why, but is there a way we can look at this timeline and maybe break it apart and spread it out a little longer so that it can work? Um, can work with the fact that, you know, we, we have staffing challenges and budgetary issues um, and we can have the opportunity to take a look more at, you know, at what grants are available because it, if it's just one year grant and we try it and we like it, that adds to the budget. So maybe there's a way we can do volunteer sharing. If one school has a lot of volunteers that wanna help and are passionate about this, they can help the schools that don't have volunteers, right? So is there a way to take a look at this timeline and the proposal that you're suggesting and take the burden off, you know, if we have staff members that can't do it at certain schools? Um, what are your thoughts on that? So um, first I, I just wanna tell you an anecdotal story about the monitors. Um, at New Lebanon School. So we did our first pilot there, I think in spring of 2019. And um, then we, we ran that pilot, we did the training, the kids had it down. Um, I couldn't get back in the fall of 2019 right away at the beginning of the school year because I was helping in another school. And about a month into school, I went to New Leb and the, the kids were doing the sorting stations perfectly. The monitors had had trained that retrained them and were like kind of watching them and and they did an excellent, excellent job. So it's doable, you know, if you have monitors who are interested and you know are listening while during the training and asking questions and engage. So it's definitely a, a something that can be very effective. And um, even when there's not volunteers, it can, it can happen because the kids get it pretty quickly. You know, they have needs a few reminders, but, you know, and especially if they have an extra set of eyes on them um, that, through the monitors, that that's helpful. Yeah. Um, Christine, I'm going to answer your question. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things and I'll ask your, answer your timeline question. Um, we, we just want to reemphasize that the plan doesn't call for any additional staff. Um, this can be executed with existing staff. The, the staff just need to know what their responsibilities are. Like the training for the custodians is really important. Um, that would take place in the beginning of the school year. Um, the custodians don't actually, per the procedures that were, uh, sorry, I forget the number, I should have it memorized now. <laughs> um, but the procedures that already exist, the custodian's responsibility written in that is actually, they don't need to do the sorting, like go into the bin and, and move the things. It actually is their responsibility to say to the teacher in the classroom, by the way, like this isn't being sorted correctly. So then they can, you know, correct that action. These things are already be, supposed to be the responsibilities that, that are supposed to happen. But um, I think that training the custodians and the lunch monitors is going to be really effective with the supplemental volunteer training. We had a volunteer, um, like an amazing volunteer at one school who went every day, right? This every day for the, all the lunch periods. In my personal opinion, I don't think that that's the best use of a, a volunteer's time to be in the, in the building to have to do that every day, right? We make a great effort, have a really thorough presentation that we deliver, and then we go back and do one or two kind of refreshers refreshers. But once the kids are trained, the monitors and the custodians also, also kind of get retrained or learn from like when we do those um, presentations, it really can be very effective. In terms of the timeline, um, the, it, it isn't written in, in, in a budget perspective. Um, it would probably be to, to finish the rest of the bins. Um, those bins, when we did, we, we paid for five of the six, like we got funding for that. And that was around 
for $1,800. Okay. $1,800 total. And we were thinking that if we, if this proposal was approved, we would be able to find the funding for that. Like there's interested uh, groups in the community that would fund those stations so we could have them in the building when school starts next year. I actually think that the, the first, you know, spring, like the, the 22 to the, the, into the fall, where, where I think everyone's getting hung up on is the organics hauling and the reusables. And that is something that we, you know, we, we keep saying that that is a future thing and kind of down the line. Um, and the whole, the intention of getting the, the proposal approved, part of that is that it's just a, it is a pilot. The organics hauling is a pilot. We're not asking for funding for all the schools now because we don't know what that number is. And we actually want to come back and share the data from that pilot with you. This is how much waste we're diverting as a district, even though, you know, you can see very clear examples from other you know, districted schools. Right, but that's what I'm saying. We ran, not we, but th this program was run as a pilot at certain schools in 1920. And I think there was even some even before that. Am I wrong? I not with the sorting stations, but not necessarily with the, the sorting stations, yeah. but the, we, we've had different pilots. But because COVID occurred, we didn't really ever get feedback or from that pilot from our own, from GPS. And so that's my point is if we could go back and do some of those pilots and, and pick up from where we left off, you were talking, you guys did some incredible work with educating the students with all of those amazing charts. I mean, I distinctly remember going to the schools and seeing them, and seeing the development of that over the years with you guys. And so, you know, then we would be able to have that because things have changed. The way we handle things in our cafeteria has changed. The way, um, you know, and again, if, if we, I don't want to add added pressure and job responsibilities because that's what this might be for lunch monitors if this is not part of their and, and if we don't have them in the school. So that was why I was asking if there's a way to kind of look at that timeline and break things apart so that we can do this and do it well, but have buy-in as we go, because we need their, you know, we need everybody's buy-in to be able to do this and do it properly. Um, it just, it's, it's, that was one of the things I was looking at when I was reading through. It's like this incredible opportunity for, for us to kind of leave less of a footprint, <laughs> but we need to be able to do it so that it's sustainable going forward. You know, who, who expected a pandemic to come in in the midst of this? But definitely, and we understand like the in, we understand the interruption of the pandemic. But in in all fairness, I don't know that like eating food and having waste has like really changed because of the pandemic. Like that aspect of it, in terms of no, but somebody the, touching somebody else's food, you know, or you know, or, or their waste of their food. That's what we're talking. If we're talking about how, and, and the way students were supposed to be sitting in our cafeterias over the, that year and, and eating and, and the waste product and things like that. I think that's what I'm referring to. So if we can go back to starting with the education piece again, and then moving it a little differently. I mean, I, again, I don't know if we're, we're talking about different pieces, but that was just my thought when I had read through it is how we can do this and do it so that you build the support and have the sustainability of it going forward. What, okay, go ahead. I was just, okay. I and in terms of the sorting stations, I think that the most critical part is having that liquid station, the recycling and the trash. The compost, as we, you know, we've been emphasizing can wait, but having those three bins in place is really important. That's a big bulk of the waste. It, yeah. When we go to do the education, you need the bin, like you need the liquids. It's, it's really the liquids, the other parts, the other components it's really nice and organized with the signage, which makes it easier with, for the students. But if you don't have the bins there in place, when we go to do the educating, they can't put the liquids anywhere. It, it's really like a simple bucket with a really nicely designed funnel to like reduce splashing. And we, and I, sorry, we've spent hundreds of hours doing pilots. Like we have real data for you. Like we've done that. We've done that work. And like we, all, all during the pandemic, we we totally understand the challenges that the school district faced in prioritizing the teachers and the students in education was like first and foremost. But at the, we think that we're in a space now where we can really get back to doing proper recycling and you know taking advantage of the results that we did before the pandemic with these this data that we have already collected. Like we've we've done quite a bit of work there. I mean, our volunteers, we have, you, you probably saw the people that gave up their evenings tonight to come to this meeting and speak and, and, you know, it's a lot of time over 
you know, nearly. Like I said, I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate all the hard work. I'm just trying like, you about, know, yeah. see how we can find I know. a way to move um, things forward. Yeah. 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 Um, how about I suggest this? Um, first of all, it's a first read, right? So we'd have to vote on it anyway. Um, I'm not sure I could add that to the next meeting because we have a lot going on. What, Christina? I was just going to say, um, it doesn't make sense because I think you guys just met with Dr. Jones in the last couple of days, it sounds like, to maybe, and, and along Karen's lines, um, to maybe come up with a plan that we feel like, to Karen's point, something that we can do at the start of school that's an achievable, right? Like, let's take, I think we all agree, like, like take certain elements out for now, you know, the, the food scraps and the sharing, but maybe just focusing on the sorting stations, right? The three, and, and if that's something that we could do at every school and see if it's doable at every school and, and use that as a starting point and then, you know, get that under the belts, tra training the kids, you said, and then we can go to the next step down the road. I don't know, Tony, is that something that feels achievable? I mean, obviously every school is different, but, it, but setting up the bins, and the signage and you know what i would say i think that we're again yes what you're saying we're very dedicated to doing that the principals that had it before today i mean they're saying they're going to have it again in the fall i don't even i don't think that's an issue the only the biggest issue is just the, the outside and the inside they think it's probably but other than that i i don't see that being huge um i remember something and and you may know but there were some buildings for some reason, they were worried about the liquid station, and and it had something to do like with where they have to pour the liquids and the older buildings. So I, I don't know if it was a sink issue. I don't know if it's a, a floor drain issue. So and, and I'm not saying it's an issue, <laughs> but I'm just saying that that's something along the way that was discussed. So things like that, we just have to look at each building again because they're also different. Ms. Carson, my concern is that as a board, we would be doing this top down on, on our principals and our buildings when this really has to be grassroots up. I mean, they really have to want this. The principal really has, and maybe they want it, but maybe they don't have, you know, maybe they just don't have the monitors, the, you know, and, and sure you can, tell kids to do what they need to do, but whether they toss the stuff in the right place on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I, don't, I don't know how to estimate that, but I really think that this has to come from the buildings themselves. I'm uncomfortable doing this top down when I think it really needs to be a school building has buy-in, they have the monitors. I mean, the staffing issue is real. I can tell you at where my kids go to school, they're stretched. So, um, and I, and I don't see more staff falling out of the sky. So I, you know, I just, I, again, feel like this, I, I'm uncomfortable as a board doing this top down. I think this really has to have buy-in from the principals. Um, that's just how I feel. I don't think I'm okay. comfortable. I don't think this, we're, we're implying that it's completely top down. It's it's top down and bottom up. It's a partnership and a collaboration. But they have that's to want why that. we're having a green team. And we know from other school districts, Wilton, West, Westport, Scarsdale, we've all visited them. We we have data from their schools. They do it the same way that we're proposing and, and it works. So why can't it work here? I, yeah, you know, I can't opine on how the districts do things. Those are smaller districts with very different demographics, by the way. But um, that aside, I, I'm sorry, I do think we're a little bit tired, admittedly, <laughs> as a group. Um, and I think that it would be prudent for us to get more feedback from our principals. Um, Obviously, we recognize this is really important. We, you know, we had a busy agenda and we made sure we, we put you on it tonight. So we, we, we obviously all value this greatly. We all have children in these schools. Uh, did you want to say something, Michael? Yeah, just, just, just one thing real quick, because as we get more information and things like that, first of all, thank you. I, I'm, I'm with Joe. I think this should be top down. We should have done it yesterday. We should have, we should have done it six months ago. So I, I, I think this is fantastic. But um beyond that um um 
the other thing to think about is um, because I, I I don't know when our custodial contract is up and and, and what the language is. It's the Teamsters all. contract. I don't know when is the Teamsters up. We don't know when it, it's not fully us. It's oh, yeah, as for negotiate with the town, it's it's more complicated than yeah. meets the eye. To be fair, that's uh, like Teamsters contract. <laughs> okay, that's all I have to say. <laughs> so um, this is important. Um, let me talk about during agenda planning. I think okay. that sounds great. And we really appreciate being here tonight. And hopefully we didn't sound defensive in some ways. <laughs> like, you know, it, um, we're like really eager to have a dialogue with you and hopefully get to a place where we can have something that works in both directions. And I don't know, Dr. Jones, if, if this would be agreeable to you, but if you and Dan wanted to get together and say, this is what we think is a workable timeline, but like a, a real timeline. And then we could also create that after the discussion tonight and kind of, you know, see where we come out with that because we, I hope that we, we want to continue moving forward. Definitely. You know, it, there's definitely challenges, but if we, if we don't get started, then, you know, we're not going to make progress. May I conclude with something? We're going to talk amongst ourselves about this. You see, you have real support on this board. And uh, so we'll talk amongst ourselves. We'll come up with some sort of solution, work together to get this accomplished. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Bramante, who is probably has to teach science in the morning. Um, We're awake. <laughs> let's go. What sort of drugs does one take to say we get this hour? I asked my husband to make a nice coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so Andy and I did provide another video for you, but the slides are also linked on board docs. So you have a one more layer of uh, transparency to kind of understand what we've got going on here. Um, we could play the video. I could give you a report. No, we're good. I saw the video. Okay. Um, and I only go straight to questions. Um, first of all, I'll just, I'll give you my huge support for this. I think that we're seeing more and more freshmen matriculate into this program. I know that there were, I was a part of the, uh, the eighth grade class that last year that looked at this very closely and the fact that you're bringing more freshmen into it, like Ashley Malkin, um, is fantastic. And so the fact that you're actually going to bring this down, to me, it, it's sort of taking the same um, course as math, right? We're starting to have kids that are going four years ahead. I know this is a different, it's not a curriculum replacement, but the fact that we keep um, pushing kids that want to be pushed to the next level um, to me is a no brainer. So I'm a huge supporter of this program. I'll pass it off to the next person that wants to talk about it. Karen Kowalski. So I really like the program and I think it's a very cool idea. I had a couple of practical questions. I think one of them was answered with respect to busing that you, we would, that parents would have to drop their kids off. But I don't think the question was answered as to how do they get back to school? So how does that get to happen? We're actually still working on that. And because of the time, it's not a course replacement like the kids who go for math. So they finish at a time when all the buses are dropping at the high school. And the way that um, Tara and Andy have done the schedule, they have the kids from one building are there on one particular day together. So it's not like you have to go out to three different middle schools. And we, at the high school, you have you have buses that go across the district. So we think we're going to be able to make it work where they can hop on a bus. Yeah, but if school starts at 8 a.m. at a school and let's say they're going to Western, they're not making it. Western starts earlier, right? And yeah. Western starts earlier, so they're definitely not making it. Uh, I just I raised that as a as a point for that was one issue. the The second question I have is this works as um, an elective class. Is it a re is it an extra class or are they getting an extra credit so they'll they're, they're not going to have a free block like we do at the that kids do at the high school. So they'll still have, this is, an, this is an additional class, it should be said. These are kids who just are really craving this opportunity. And, you know, I think I said in my board note, we could have just started the club on our own and not even brought it to the board, which is how clubs work. But we think the kids would really benefit from having this as an elective on their uh, middle school transcript, because a lot of our eighth graders do apply for some phenomenal summer opportunities. And it would be look good to be able to say, they took this as an elective class and self-driven also to want to do it. So it is additional. 
And then my, my last question is in regard to the number of students. And I realize that this would be the first year you're doing it, but do we think 12 is the right number? Because um, I just wonder if there's, if you get a, a, an overwhelming response um, and some really great applications. It, one, it makes it one difficult to select, but two, are we, how did you come up with 12? Maybe that's the quick way to get to that question. I, I think I, I can feel that. Oh, sorry. I mean, I've been doing this for some time and essentially what, you know, there, there comes a point where you could have just too many kids and not enough effort, you know, not enough attention for the students. Um, so since I'm, you know, typically in the in the research classroom at the high school, it runs anywhere from 12 to 15. You know, 15 is usually the max in, in any given section. And they're, you know, keep in mind, they're doing it a little more often during the week. So I figured 12 would be a really nice, you know, number to, since it's only meeting once a week for these kids throughout the year to really get some good traction and really give them the attention that they deserve. You know, they, they're they're coming at this from a different point of view. They're they're younger, you know. They're they're more curious. They're more imaginative, but they're going to need a little more guidance, in my opinion. So that's kind of how I came across the, how I came up with the twelve, um, you know. And you know, getting back to you know the interest, you know, I, I really just want to stress that you know the kids that will be interested will be inherently interested. They're going to, and that is very easily picked out in this application process that I put together for the high school, where you can easily tell the difference. But, you know, in that process, for example, you get a lot of kids that, you know, I usually have a meeting that where I, I say, anybody that's got interest in the class, come to this meeting. And the number drops precipitously from the number of kids that attend that meeting to the number of kids that actually put that uh, proposal together and show me that they really are interested in, in, in spending the time, you know, to, to do this. It's a, it's a unique student. You know, I, I learned this early on when I started teaching at the high school where it's not the student that gets the A plus, that's the perfect research student. Um, it's that kid that can, you know, put aside some time to really, you know, approach his, curio his or her curiosity and, and, and go for it, you know? So hopefully that answers your question. But no, it does. I appreciate it. Uh, obviously, you're you're the expert, the professional in this one. I was just curious as to how you you came up with the number twelve. But look, I'm I like this program a lot. I think it's a great idea. Um, I think one of the areas in middle school that we've been we we needed to build up was the science program, particularly because we don't have yeah, or an advanced program in science. And this gives those kids an opportunity to to shine. Um, and I would, I'm really interested to see where this goes and the, the opportunity to see what it could be built upon over the course of time. So I don't know, you know, obviously other people have questions, so I don't want to monopolize this, but I also want to make sure that this gets done. And if if it's on for a read, do we have to we have to vote on and approve? When can we do that? Because I don't want to slow these guys down. Central, central vote. We'll put it on with the central vote, right? All the more reason to get the central vote going. Just saying. Okay, <laughs> Miss Downey. Yes, thank you so much, Andy, um, for making this proposal. Um, one of my children actually did the science program at the high school. Um, How's, so, How's that young man? Um, he's he's actually left science and gone into a finance career, sadly. Oh, um, but anyway, a couple of years aside, but, he, but he was a biomedical engineer for three I years so. out of college. So now he's going to do the business side of it. Um, but I, I can't say enough good things about the program at the high school and the thought of having our middle schoolers have the opportunity to do this is beyond spectacular. I think it's phenomenal. And I actually think it's right to do it as a class. If it's a club, you know, kids show up, don't show up. If it's a class, they're committed to coming. Um, they're invested in the process. I think it'll be more worth, they'll get more out of it. And I think Mr. Bermont will get more motivated students out of it. So I wholeheartedly um, support this idea. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Hey, Andy. How you, hey, doing? Uh, How you doing, Joe? I'm doing good. Hey, uh, uh, my daughter is still in science, as you know, so she influenced her tremendously. And uh, uh, my concern is that are you spreading yourself a little too thin for that high school crowd? 
Um, no, I mean, what, you know, the, the give back here was to, um, you know, while I was teaching the research class, it, you know, I was teaching ESL chem as well. So that's kind of what, you know, what was taken off the plate. And so we've kind of arranged it where, you know, these middle schoolers would come early in the morning and then there's a gap of time. And then I have the research kids uh, blocks four, five, and six. Um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the work that happens, as you likely know, because, you, you know, uh, Christy went through it, is really after school, you know, and then when it really gets going, it's during the weekend, it's during the breaks. And so, you know, the, the classroom time is really, there's a lot of planning, there's a lot of, you know, consulting, where are you, what's, mo you know, what went wrong, how can we, you know, how can you do things differently? Um, but the kids that the kids that I talk about at these board meetings, for example, they spend an inordinate amount of time, and it's those are, those are the kids that you're looking for, or that I'm looking for in this process. So I, I I think it's very manageable to come back to your question, and the kids that will go after it and take advantage are going to spend more time than that 45 minutes once a week. They will. You 100% have my support. You do great work. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Tara, just real fast, um, following on Karen Kowalski's question, would you be able to tell us if there's anything um, happening in terms of the advanced science program at the middle school? Uh, yeah, moving off of where we were when I reported this K-8 STEM report, we are separating the two courses. So we're going to have an advanced section and a non-level section. We're separating them in grades six through eight. And our eighth grade course, we're bringing down those high school standards from earth and space science that aren't currently covered in a geology course before the 11th grade NGSS test. So we've got a little bit of work to do during our summer curriculum work, but uh, we've got some big plans for that. That is great news. Thank you so much. Yes, Karen Hirsch. Well, you just took my bigger question, which was about the advanced science for sixth through eighth grade. Um, so hello to uh, to Tara and to Andy on this. I, I had sent a couple of questions over and I, I love this idea. I think I mean, I've seen uh, with my with my jaw to the ground some incredible work that our students have done at the high school level on this and to give them that opportunity for at least the students that are, are interested in this the younger grades, I think is fantastic. Um, I do have a few additional follow up questions, which I can always wait to to ask, because I know you guys are still working through some of the details. Um, and the one question I have, and I think that this is something, you know, I know this year we seem to have more eighth graders, who, you know, uh, rising ninth graders that were select, you know, applied and, and I know there's a few in this year's as ninth graders in, um, you know, I know that the information is wasn't always shared equally, not as strongly as at each of the middle schoolers, the middle schools for eighth graders to know that they had the opportunity to do this. Um, so I think that that's just a, some feedback because I think, especially with this coming, this would be exceptionally important now for those kids to know yeah. uh, if they want to do it. Um, so I don't know how, on average, I know you answered for me how many uh, applicants you typically have for uh, rising ninth graders and how many spaces mm -hmm. you have. And uh, for those who want to do this in the eighth grade, you know, will they be better? Does that give them a leg up over students who aren't ready per se in eighth grade if they want to apply to do this in yeah. ninth grade or 10th grade? That's my only. I, I liken that to, uh, that's a yes and no answer. I mean, the idea that they've gone through it will certainly give them the skill set that we hope they get, you know, from this program, um, you know, and that should carry forward. But, you know, I, the way I can answer that is this, you know, to answer your question very bluntly, no, because what I do is I look at all of the applications very blindly um, when they come, you know, for the kids entering the high school. And I look at them not for, um, not for the cure of cancer, not for a regurgitation of NPRs, latest in science, not for those that are written by parents, but I'm looking for things that are really written out of curiosity, imagination, kids that really are telling me what they wanna do and they may not know how, but the idea that they can tell me that they've got this inherent curiosity. And so that's kind of how I do it. Um, but you know, at the same time, and I kind of said this in my answer to you earlier, is what it will do is it will probably sway those numbers so they will be more, more freshmen because right now they are clearly the lowest number you know, in the pool that are in the high school. So now you probably will, you will get more competitive you know, applications for the incoming, 
ninth graders because they've taken part in this and that can only be a positive. Um, but at the same time, when I have students that apply and their, you know, their proposal falls short, typically, you know, I can't tell you how much value there is. And this is a personal thing I've never shared. So here it comes. But if a student comes to me and says, hey, you know, Mr. B, I, I, I want to understand why it wasn't good enough and I want to improve it. You know, in my mind, that's an automatic you're getting in next year because you kept coming at me and you kept showing interest. And so, you know, if they don't get in as an eighth grader, they can certainly apply as a ninth grader, 10th grader. And, you know, they, they will have opportunities if the, if the, you know, if the interest is real is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, yes and no, you know, I, I guess that, you know, if they don't make it the first time, they will get in eventually if they really are persistent about their interest. I just, the reason I'm asking is I just want to make sure it's clear to, you know, I, I don't want to dissuade. I love the idea. We want to push our students. We want to give them more rigor. We want our kids to want more um, and to expand their horizons and take that leap into the, into the unknown and, and do this research. My only fear is, and I want to make sure, make it clear so that we talk about it here uh, for a student that isn't necessarily ready to take that leap in eighth grade. Yeah. And they're ready by ninth grade. Or yeah, sure. I don't want them to feel that the kid that did it in eighth grade has a has a better shot at it. And as long oh. as we can make sure that that's clear to these to our students that they shouldn't be afraid to put forward these proposals, then that's fantastic. I mean, the more yeah. we can do to support our students with STEM and STEAM and 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 natural inquiry, I think is great. Yeah. All right. Anything else on this topic? Okay, this will come back for a vote, um, hopefully next week with the Central Middle School. Yes. Can we, can we just vote now? Yeah, I think, sure, if we wanna make a, how do we do it again? Let's make a motion that you're going to, you know, um, we need six votes to say that we would take it up now. Uh, two thirds. There's still, well, well. Isn't it two, we need two thirds to say that we would move it up to vote on it now. So do you wanna make a motion to, um, what's the word? Kathleen, I don't Thank know you. if that's permissible. Oh, because it's a special meeting? It's a special meeting and it was not listed as an action oh, item. It was listed as geez. discussion only. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, Andy. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, but he made, Michael made a good point. It's because, this is a special meeting, so we can't do that. And I didn't have it as an action item, as a discussion, so I can't move it that way. If we're meeting next Wednesday night, on the zoom we could just add it yeah. to that we'll just add it to that we can meet a little earlier and add it on if you want to do that let's just agree to spend no time on it and vote it in I, well, unless there's questions that I'm in. So, there, there could be questions oh boy karen no i think we're saying there can't be <laughs> okay so thanks i think i i think you have a sense that we're going to support this okay i appreciate it I really uh, do. thank you so much good night okay good guys i don't guys just to say i don't know how you do what you do is this, is Neither do we sometimes. <laughs> but I, I appreciate every one of you. Have a good oh, night. Thank you too. Good night. Okay, Mr. Kelly, tell us about the waterfall. Waterfall project. It's a cleanup uh, and a de-weeding of that abandoned lot that you might happen to notice, uh, Route 1 and Hillside. Uh, we're going to have a crew of people coming in there, a bunch of volunteers on uh, Saturday, this Saturday, from 10 to 1 o'clock. Uh, we're not going to dig any holes. Uh, we're not going to change the, the land at all. We're just going to pick up the garbage. We're going to cut the weeds. Uh, we're going to uh, make sure it starts to look nice. And it's going to be a three-phase process. Phase one, cleanup. Phase two, we're going to do a design. Uh, Sam Bridge has, uh, has given their services to us to do a design uh, for some plantings. We will then bring that design proposal to the board uh, before the board for approval. Uh, once the board approves the uh, design uh, and we get uh, all the things we need to do in order to plant certain, uh, uh, certain plants, bushes, and possibly trees, because I know the tree warden is lurking and he wants to be involved in some degree. So therefore, uh, we will then bring him on board. And then the third phase will be the maintenance for perpetuity of this beautiful piece of property. That is the, uh, all of the waterfall project. Thank you. Ms. Downey? Just a question. In, in the phasing, um, after we have a cleanup and a design, to the extent there's any plantings, doesn't P and Z 
or wetlands or whoever whoever has the domain over those sorts of things, the tree warden, um, are you going through, you'll go through that process with them to get approvals? We will go through all the necessary process to get all the approvals. Yes, correct. We were, There's several organizations uh, who are involved in this who do a lot of this around town and they're quite familiar with these organizations and work with them quite regularly. Sorry, Karen. Um, well, since I know you are uh, doing this awesome uh, volunteer, you're having a volunteers come, I know there's no you know, budget for that. If Sam Bridge is uh, stepping forward to give us possible design to bring for approval, uh, I don't know if there's any kind of budget that is required for that. Um, well, that is a great question. Thank you. This is a so this was my private, next yeah. public private partnership, totally funded outside the budget of the Board of Education. Any donations will certainly be brought before the board for approval. So that's what I was going to say, because we have that entire process for, you know, even if it's in-kind labor or Correct. any kind of other things. Um, so I'm happy to make sure you have all the appropriate. Thank you for making sure this. we will dot the I's and cross the T's. Thank you. That's thank you. All right. That's a lot of thank yous. OK, who wants to move to action items? <laughs> Woo. OK, Christina Downey, talk to us about policy. I'm, I'm going to do these as two separate items, just because I think it's yep, we'll out the way, no problem. Okay, the first I'm going to do is make a motion that the board adopt policy 5131.911 as presented. I am happy to second it. Okay. Um, so the boat, this is a revised bullying policy, which was looked at for a first read. Um, it's an existing policy that we have in which the definition of bullying was changed to conform to the state statute, which had changed. Um, then we as a committee, policy committee, added some language about in the first paragraph to say as defined herein. Um, and then Michael Joseph had requested that the word creed be added on to item seven on page five, and that has been added. Those are the only changes. Um, any discussion, questions? Seeing none, you want to bring us right to a vote? Happy to call the question. Okay. Um, Sorry, ahead, I had Karen. one question. So I have been getting some questions regarding this policy and I just, I just wanted some just general clarification. Um, I think to to admit I haven't. I'm not sure where it is in here, but do you, is there anything in here with regards to the um, implementation? So I guess the the regulation, not the I guess the regulation part of this that requires students to take surveys or fill out information. I, I see that it has a component of here, whereas you could anonymously report, but there's, with respect to anything that's reported on bullying, it's just, it's a standard policy about what happens, what defines bullying and what happens afterwards, correct? Yes. All right. Are you good then? Or no? Good. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So there's a motion on the table. So all in favor? That passes. Yes, I had. Yep, that passes 8 0. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Downey, next policy. Okay, I'm going to move that the board adopt policy 9325 as presented. I'll second that. Um, this is the second read of this policy. The first read was many months ago. Um, in which we did discuss changing the time limit, which we, uh, for public speakers, which we have left at three minutes. Um, the committee had cleaned up some language in paragraph one because it was a little unwieldy in the process of doing that. And then in addition, policy governance added a paragraph five, just the notion of our one hour of public hearing was kind of buried in some regulations. We thought it was appropriate to have it in this policy which discusses our meeting conduct where we say one hour will be allotted prior to conducting a business and in the event we exceed one hour it'll be at the conclusion of the meeting 
And those are the only changes to the policy from what exists at present. That makes sense to me. I know we spent some time on this earlier in the year. So um, I appreciate that being sort of clear. Any other discussion on this? Okay. okay. Sorry. So I'm slow because I'm tired. I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to add that um, with respect to this policy, we had gone back and forth and I just wanted to articulate that we obviously heard the overwhelming response when we wanted to manage it efficiently. And I'll say it again, and I said it back then, that the only thing that we were attempting to do was manage the meeting more efficiently, as I'm looking at the clock that says 11.38, as opposed to stifling anyone's speech. If anyone knows me, I am the last person that would be wanting to stifle speech. I just wanted to create an efficient meeting process. So I think we've accounted for that here and not changing any of that, but moving this forward just to art further articulate the practice that we've already implemented. I 100% agree with that. I know that you and I were on the same page on that. That was our goal. <laughs> um, okay. Seeing no further. Okay, questions on this? All in favor of this policy? That passes 8-0. Thank you. Okay, now um, we have a meeting plan, agenda plan. Ms. Downey. Yes, um, uh, last meeting, the draft agenda meeting plan for the 22-23. Oh, I, actually, no, I have to make a motion first, right? You do have to we approve the 22-23 Board of Ed meeting agenda plan as presented. Ms. Kowalski, second it. Um, so at our last meeting, um, it was discussed about this is our plan for next year, trying to keep it consistent with certain things in every meeting, um, as well as thinking through the process. Um, we changed the location of all the meetings to have a Meyer, except for some, some central ones. I mean, I'm sorry, to have a Meyer or central, not to go to all the schools, to allow for Zoom participation um, and engagement at all our meetings. It's too difficult to do that when traveling from school to school in terms of the technology. And we also added a meeting, which was not originally in our meeting schedule for next year, for September 15th of a capital summit. So those are the, the low lights or highlights, depending on your point of view, um, to this. And as we all know, we, we change it from meeting to meeting when we do agenda planning at the end of every meeting. But this is our framework for next year. And we are certainly not afraid to add meetings. We're very good at that. Um, OK, any discussion on this? I call the question. OK, all right, all in favor? That passes 8-0. Okay, we're on a roll. Okay, uh, Mr. O'Keefe, oh, let's get this motion on the table, sorry, authorizing summer transfers. Okay, um, I'll put the motion to authorize the Board of Ed Executive Committee to approve all budget appropriation transfers during a special board meeting date to be determined. Okay. Um, I had a question. This. Yeah, you want me to explain it? Please. Okay. Um, so basically, there will be a bunch of transfers that um, Sean will have to do as he closes out the year. And so this is just giving the authority to the executive committee, Karen, which is you, me, and Karen, to basically approve that. What? Yes, we don't have to have a bunch of meetings. So we don't have to have a bunch of meetings. So like the three of us get together. So like last year, Peter Bernstein, myself, and Karen, got to, you authorized it. We got together. And we just sort of blessed it. So now it'll be the three of us, but the board is approving, is giving us that ability. Do all three, do all three need to agree in order for it to be approved? Correct, it to be a vote, yeah. Well, actually, no, I guess it right. be, I was just gonna say. I guess it could it be two, one, technically. Right, is that right, Sean? Or Dr. Jones, I, I guess. I'm sorry, what's the question? Uh, technically, if they if they give the authority for like we've done every year where we just agree to, it's, you're basically like, it's accounting. You're just like moving things between accounts. If the eight of them give the authority to the Karens in May, it, it could in theory pass by 2-1, right? It doesn't need to be a unanimous vote, I guess. Do you know what I'm asking? I know what you're asking, but I, I don't know the answer to it. I, I, I would assume a 2-1 would pass. 
Yeah, I guess. I don't, Michael. I, I don't. We've never had that issue. I guess. So I the think last it's... couple of years, it was three zero. Can we amend it to make it so it's three zero? Just, just sure. seems prudent. I don't know if you can amend it to make it three zero. Only the fact that it's Robert's rules. Like you have to, we have to follow Robert's rules, and that would be suspending a different policy as well. Either way, I'd assume if there was something that really somebody was opposed to, we would sit and have a discussion, and it might be something that would not just get a rubber stamp. That would be my theory. Yeah, I don't even know, because the policy that I'm thinking about only governs the fact that it has to be a majority vote, and four can be a majority. And it, uh, it has to be a majority vote, right? And it's talking about the eight of us. And so, for example, if something passes, you know, four to two, like things have passed before, that's a majority of those that voted because it's four to two, but that doesn't necessarily work because it said you actually have to have a minimum of four votes, which we would, wouldn't have here. Um, I mean, you could just not grant us authority. I guess that would be the better way of doing it. And you'd have to bring the vote to the, back to the eight of us because I don't think we want to, I don't think we can amend the rules, I guess, around that. So the other thing is you could just say, you're happy to get together in the summer and vote on summer transfers. But, but there's no, I don't understand. There's no way to. If amend. you make that change, you have to physically be here. Yeah, there's no way to do the amendment and just say that. I don't think so. Power, be changing. The, the power is with all three as long as they all agree. It seems weird that we wouldn't be able to do that. All right. I mean, I, I, go ahead, Ms. Downing, maybe in a more. This is just about transfers to close out the books. This is all between now and July 1, correct, Sean? This, this is all about, it's just it's just year-end plumbing to ensure that all the major object codes are in the black. And this is also to cover like what the shortfall, we're, we're basically taking leftover money from certain accounts and moving it into other accounts to cover the shortfall, for example, for out-of-district special ed tuition. For so, so we're returning money back to the district. And then we return money back to the district. And we're to return the money back, right? If there's leftover? Yeah, it doesn't seem like it'll be an issue for this one. I just in the future if we ever have other areas where we're delegating we, we don't usually delegate this is like the thing we really sort of dedicate this is kind of the only just thing. because it's like it's because it makes like you feel better closing the books we could all just get together that's another option well you kind of have to heat i mean it would be in the summer because so, it has to be after he closes the books so well it's going to be before july 1st so the question is before July 1st. The question right. is, when will it be coming? Because can that be part of? Uh, mm -hmm. no, no, it's because he still is, he'll go past July 1. Yeah. To closing the box. It's like, yeah. It's basically like reporting the quarter after the quarter <laughs> closes. So. And then this also needs to go to the BET after the, uh, the board approves. Right, that's right. That's right. They have, they have one summer meeting in July. That that is it. Assuming we do it, yeah. I really don't think this would ever be met with any controversy. I'm going to call the question. It's not new expenditures. It's just. You know, I just don't understand why you, the delegation can't be requiring three instead of a majority. Just I don't I don't know. It's never happened before. I think it'd be an odd precedent to change it. I think it's if we don't get to three zero, I could tell you that majority, I, just because that's how the voting how like, voting I mean, always works, right? Well, yeah, it was based on Robert's rules, and that's why I say I don't I I didn't research it today, but I think that that's the case. You don't have to ever have a majority, you know, a unanimous vote for something. One way to resolve this going forward, if I'm reading between the lines with respect to Cody, is that you do it, you have four people on the executive committee and it's based upon. Yeah, but, but again, no, I, I'm not asking you to change it now. I'm no, you saying, can't. Have, there's no other, the, the only, technically, the only thing a, this board would need is a chair and a secretary. That is what the executive board is. We have a vice chair. And so that's what the executive committee is. You can't just add another member because it's a very specific delegation and it is it's not just based on us it's a state requirement to have this chair and the secretary and it is specifically those executive committees are created for specifically for the situation if you have some kind of an emergency or needs to be done that you don't have to convene an entire board 
uh, of eight. Okay. Um, I, oh, I think that that's what it might be. Can you just say like if there's a two one, then it comes back to the overall board? Again, I'd have to go look, but it's based on Robert's rules, and that's how we run our meetings. It's like that's part of our bylaws. It's just, it's not just us. It's it's in general how boards do their voting. I mean, I can go back and look, but I'm pretty sure you can't require a unanimous. I mean, I guess you could kick it back, but then that's what's the point. I mean, it's. I'm just as happy for you guys to not to give us authorization rather than changing the rules. I think it's safe to say we won't be able to change the rules now. Right. So, but we could, we could just all seriously, it's fine. I actually, it's yeah. separately just another time when it's not almost midnight. So, um, so don't approve it, it and we can have a meeting. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, all of us. It was just I, fine. I, I have to be there one way or the other. Sense, doesn't sweat off my back. The Robert's <laughs> rules stuff is invoked often. I would love to understand what the the, the guidelines. Book, not, yeah. I don't care about what the rules are. I, I care about to the extent that we're bound versus where their guidelines. Uh, that's that that would I'd like to know the answer to that at some point. Okay. So do you honestly? I I really. I mean, I'm there either way. So I'm kind of indifferent on which way this vote goes. Honestly. So let's vote on it. Okay. So the motion on the table is to authorize the executive committee on this summer, whatever I said, on the summer transfers. Um, all in favor? Okay, that passes 8-0. Okay. Um, what? I'm I'm sure, exactly. Okay, um, next up, let me see if I can get this on the table. Budget priorities and procedures, if anyone has it in front of them. Um, Okay. Um, uh, approve the fiscal year 2024 budget procedures. So this is a this is a draft of the full year 2024 budget pr uh, priorities and procedures. Uh, Karen Hirsch has already uh, asked a few questions. Uh, uh, so there's one of them was in the on the first page at the bottom budget development procedures. Uh, on the first sentence, the superintendent will establish goals and priorities as the basis for budget decisions that align with GPS strategic plan 2015 through 21. Their suggestion or question was, uh, you know, based on upon board approval. No, is it because we're right now revising, we're gonna have a new strategic plan with different dates. Right. So it'd be silly to plan next year's budget on a strategic plan that will have been retired by then. So it was, do we want to change that? And instead of having strategic plan 2015, 21, you could take the date out. Just take the date out. You could just, just take the date out. out, or you could say, you know, align with the new strategic plan upon board approval. But it, I, I just figured you might want to take out the year because it won't be relevant anymore. If we take the dates out, it's the same meaning and it just does and doesn't have it's not inconsistent. I think taking the dates out is clean from Karen. Yeah, that's fine. I thought, but that was my sort of question, just because it's you're not building a budget based on a <laughs> strategic plan that's been retired. Go ahead, Michael Joseph. I had, I, had a, I had a similar question about um, um, the board board goals, which I know are still in draft form. But if but that's not part of the budget. Why wouldn't it be though? Uh, I don't know. There's not you, well, I guess because our goals are tied in with the. But it, but it says here, it says that the budget documentation should allow for the BOE to link between the budget and the goals, strategic initiatives, and core academic. So right. What, so you don't the need goals to. goals are we referring to? It's to, well, I would assume it's, well, I didn't write it, but it's board goals, superintendent goals. But the only reason I was asking about strategic plan is because it had the date. I had, I had another question while you're reading that. That's okay. Um, does this include Sean's the new capital improvement process that I know Fred and his team have and have put into place? or suggested, this is why the capital plan is gonna come now earlier next year, like in October. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly will. I mean, it's a it's a new town process, so we would always follow the town process. We can certainly add in uh, another item that says follow the new CIP process. Do you think we should? Anyone, do you guys think so? Yeah. I think we have to. Right. Okay, I think, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's very clear that that's the new plan, right? So. Go ahead, Michael Joseph. I think we did. We saw this right last time, or no? No. Oh no. Oh boy. Okay. Okay. That's why there's always new questions. Okay. So why don't we? This central middle school meeting is starting to look like a lot of fun. It's a. It's full of action items that will be fast. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, this just. I mean, we just got this like yesterday. No, that's fair. So let's make the changes well, that isn't it based on the so the, There was something. You know, another reason why it came late. I think, uh, yeah, perhaps. Well, then I had one other question, which I had sent over to Sean, and which I will say here. And if we want to have, if we're not voting on this, it makes even more sense, which was under the budget development procedures, that second paragraph. Uh, if a new program or service initiative is being considered for the upcoming fiscal year, it will be presented to the board by the superintendent no later than September 30th. Uh, well, for instance, earlier tonight, and it's definitely not September 30th, we were just presented with a uh, possible new uh, <laughs> program or service initiative and we have a new course or you know the middle school uh, is my point was more uh, is September 30th really a realistic date uh, or do we need to change the date or whatever I, I gotta it is not realistic so if we're, if we're not voting on this tonight can we can you <laughs> do you want to do you guys want to take a look at that date and think about uh, Revising that. By the way, recognize too that Sean's setting us up. He's leaving us with this. So we really uh, the big kiss goodbye. <laughs> Appreciate it. But anyway, I saw that and I thought to my and, and then by the way, below an operating budget, it also has the strategic plan date of 2015 to 22, which should then also be removed. Okay, so I think we have a few changes. Miss Costin. I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> You are denied. <laughs> you can't skip the rest of them. You got to go through the whole process there. We're not done yet. <laughs> I second um, it. <laughs> not hearing you. Come on. Um, okay. So, how do you want us? You, we have a, a bunch of comments here. We're clearly getting silly. Do you want us to? Do you have them, Sean, or do you want us to send an email with all of them? Um, I, I think I have them all. But there was there was uh, two others that. Uh, Karen uh, had mentioned as well. Uh, one was the utilization, adding in the utilization of ESSER ARP funding in the operating budget. We already have it in the capital section. So yes, we should add that. Uh, and then there was one about- uh, Yeah, it was under number five, ADA compliance. Yeah, the, the other one is the ADA. I think we should, Karen, I think we should add that to, instead of number, five or squeezing in a 4a maybe under number four facility standards including ada compliance i just know from the year prior that's where we had it that's why i was asking it was under a uh, capital budget was number five priorities which include uh, this one now says health and safety maintenance requirements blah 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 it just before it said ada Okay, so we'll, we'll but, put it in a, we'll put it in a but wherever you think it works, if it's yeah, under number right. four, wherever you think it works, I just, I figured ADA's compliance is still one of our priorities. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll add it uh, standalone. Is it possible to just get a red line between this document and what we had last year, just to see what we're changing and how we're changing it? That might be easier to um, facilitate our comments. Yeah, that's a good point. Would that be okay, Sean? Thank you. Okay, so I this, um, this is clearly we're not gonna take action on this tonight, that's fine. There's a bunch of changes. So this will come back in our agenda planning with the other things that I'm forgetting to add. Okay, good. Yep, no vote. Uh, so do we need a motion to uh, suspend no. The vote? No, no, no. no we just don't vote. Okay. okay, all right, good. All right, moving on. Um, this is my motion up on the table. This is a motion for the chair to sign the contract memorializing Dr. Jones' 2% raise for 2022-2023. Ms. Downey. 
Oh, he's not going to thank you, Miss Downey. Okay. Yes, exactly. So this is just for me to actually be authorized to sign that. Um, yes, Michael Joseph. Well, the contract is agreeing to basically each year we we negotiate the salary, right? And so the two percent was in the budget. So the two percent wasn't in the contract. No, every year we like so she took a zero during COVID, and then we put two percent in the budget this year, and this just authorizes me memorializing it. Go ahead, Ms. Costin. What are are we allowed to give her more? We are. Um, it's not in the budget. We should probably have talked about that at the budget time. What about all that extra money we're about to give back to the town? <laughs> I appreciate your I think this one was going to have a lot to give back. <laughs> Don't be so sure. I had to pay for dinner tonight, for God's sakes. We didn't have that much money, no. <laughs> it was Esther money. Exactly. We don't have a refreshments budget. I, I, know, I, 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 did, I did a little research and... Uh, yeah, I, I think going forward, we should have that discussion before budget time or after budget time. And just saying, we have an incredible uh, superintendent, as you read uh, her review last week. So, you know. All right. So I'm going to call this vote. All in favor? Okay. That passes 8 0. Thanks very much. Okay. Moving to the financial and staffing report. I put a motion, I'll put this on the table. Sorry, I'm really losing. Um, authorizing the financial report for the period ended May 31st, 2022. Is there a second, Ms. Downey? Okay, Mr. O'Keefe. Okay, uh, so as of the end of May, our year-to-date actual is 150.8 or 86.7% attainment of the full year budget, 173.9. That compares to an attainment at this same point last year, about 88%. So that's a positive sign that you know we're slightly better on, the, on an attainment basis. On a year to year basis, we're up 7 million year to year or 4.8%. That compares to a budgeted growth rate of 5.2%. So again, slight better uh, sign. Um, the primary drivers of the year-to-year -year growth, the 7 million uh, salaries are up 800,000 or about 7.7%. Uh, Services are up uh, four and a half million or 28% driven primarily by transportation and special ed tuition. Um, so the uh, transportation driven primarily by contractual increases, additional sped routes and uh, and last year we had lower spending due to two, two one week periods where we didn't have school due to COVID. Um, bottom line for this year, I think, uh, you know, it's been tight all year with overruns in special ed. And uh, you know, we did have a limited expense freeze in March that uh, continues to this day. Um, I, think we're, I think we're still in good shape. Um, and that's even with containing the additional police. So there's a lot of balls in the air. We, you know, we expect to close in the next uh, two weeks, but uh, I do believe that we should be okay. Um, capital available balance down 200K from the April report. Um, the only other uh, notable thing in this uh, report is that the GHS entryway project uh, we reclassified from the 21 and 22 lines into the building committee projects, but, uh, which is where it belongs. And again, you know, the numbers reflect that, uh, you know, we continue to have a focus on closing out the projects, especially those from full year 21 and, and prior. Um, and since uh, September of 2020, when we started tracking the uh, pre-22 project available balance, it says, come down significantly uh, by about a little over $20 million uh, or about 70% of those balances. Over to food services, uh, with May behind us, we continue to see a significant shortfall in cash sales due to the free meals for all program, which will continue to the end of the year. Uh, last I heard that will not continue into next year. Uh, however, state reimbursements uh, have been significantly higher than what we expected. Uh, we're, you know, 
up about uh, $3.4 million uh, versus the cash sales being down 2.4. So when you net those out, we expect our, uh, our total revenue to be above budget by about a million dollars. Um, and then finally on expense, uh, with the uh, lower spending in supplies and materials, we expect to be about $200,000 below budget. So good news in uh, food services, doing pretty well. Um, and uh, let's see, over to special ed tuition, there's really not much change in the SPED chart in the back of the package. You know, we're still looking at about coming in at 8.4 million, which would be a million one over budget and about 600K higher than what we projected at the beginning of the year. Um, the ARP ESSA chart in the back of the package, the way back, back of the package, it's the same chart that was reviewed by the board, approved by the board, approved by the BET and approved by the uh, RTM. So no change there. Uh, I know I'm taking this out of order. I hope it's okay. Can we do transfers now? <laughs> Are you joking? What's that? Oh, I thought you meant the summer transfers. I'm like, I could have sworn we just talked about it. Oh, no, no. Okay. There, 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 is, <laughs> there, is, there, is, there is one transfer in the month, which is for information only. Um, you know, it, uh, it does not, it's all within the same major object code. It's a transfer of 632,000 to cover higher expenses in medical consulting. Um, and it's driven primarily by the costs associated with hiring a, uh, the contractor for you know a teacher of the hearing impaired substitute nurses and higher OTPT services. Um, so so that's that's an information one. So no action required on that. And that is it. Okay. All right. Motion on the table is to accept the financial report. All in favor of accepting it. Oh sorry, go ahead, Karen. So my question relates to one of the contracts on, I don't know what page it's on. Three. Three, sorry. Um, the district learning, the focused on learning, it's called TEPL training sessions. What is this? I just, it, it's, it comes up periodically, not every month, but at times. And I'm just, like, I, I get the, with respect to special ed, that piece of it and other therapies, but this one, I just don't understand what, what, what is focused on learning? Focused on learning is, is the name of the company uh, that provides the TEPL training sessions. It's also incidentally the same company that is doing all of the, the curriculum updates, you know, and, you know, the Todd White, uh, that's, that's fo he's focused on learning. And the, the 211 480 is, is for TEPL training. The, the original contract was established for TEPL training, but there's also some professional learning in there. Um, so it's more than just the TEPL training. Um, the, the other focused on learning expenses are, um, those are deliverables and you know, do not have a contract. So the 211 is just for the a portion of services, consulting services provided by Focused on Learning. So this is the, these are the these are trainings that are given, and they're given every every month or so. I just I was curious because I went back through, and, and we've spent almost a million dollars on this since September. So I was just curious as to where this falls within the within the budget. I'm not familiar with the million dollars. I mean, are you including the all of the curriculum updates uh, for the month? No, I was just looking on the uh, what what's been spent on focused on learning. I, I didn't realize if you should if you bring, I added them all together. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I just was like, I don't know what this is, and so I was like, well, where where am I seeing this? And so it it comes up periodically at, on certain months, and so I was just curious because it's not all the same amount; it's different amounts, and I just was curious as to what it was and um, how that's accounted for, that's all. Sean, do you want me to speak to that a little bit? Um, so Focused on Learning is actually the consultant company that we use, 
all across the district. So everything from Temple training, the largest portion this year is over $600,000 in all of the new materials that are being produced for middle school English, GLA, and middle school um, history. Uh, which we've been working on that. And that's a whole team of people from Focused on Learning uh, that are working with our staff on all of that. Um, we also, um, especially Todd White, he's worked in the district for a long time and very, very highly regarded. So uh, principals actually use some of their site-based money and they'll uh, bring him in just to come and visit classrooms and give feedback on teaching and learning. Uh, most recently, last week, he was working with um, special education and the uh, well, I don't know if he did the work last week or he's coming next week, but um, he's working on co-teaching and doing co-teaching workshops. So it's just really high level professional development is a lot of it. And then curriculum materials that he helps us produce. Karen? Um, well, I think this is, I had sent you a question separately and I didn't realize it tied in with this. So I, you know, I had asked about the contract for Todd and, and for next year. And so maybe that might be, I don't know if, I know you don't have the answer yet, but that might be going forward as a discussion that we could have. What was the question, Karen? Well, you and I are in the curriculum council. And so I had sent a question saying for next year, because Todd was talking about the, the work that's continuing for next year. I said, do we have a year to year, con is it a yearly contract or is it a contract for the in the majority of the work. And I, so I had asked specifically, uh, you know, in that regards, and I didn't realize it was much, that it was things that were going beyond. So I just fit that might be just a helpful information to know if it's a year to year contract or a, a project based one. And we can have that discussion. Not it's tonight. definitely project based. Like it's, we bring him in to be specific. Contract. It's a year to year contract based on what needs to be done and what we need his expertise for. It's all project. It's like time and materials project. Okay. There you go. Training and everything. Oh, okay. Is that good? Okay. All right. Um, all in favor of accepting the financial report as is one, two, three, four, five. Is that right? Six? Like six? Did I see? Okay. Did you, Michael Joseph, were you in favor or no? Oh, no. so it's I'm not. suggesting on principle that I don't think we should vote. He doesn't think we should vote on it, and he's right because I don't know why I keep putting on as an action. But okay, so you can object on. So you're going to abstain, or are you saying no? Uh, yeah, we'll do abstain this week. Okay, and what would you like, Karen? No. You want to know? Okay, so that's cool. So that's six one one. Let's just mix it up. Okay, cool. All right. Um, okay, I'm going now to the agenda plan and it was it's historical because June 16th should have been the end of the agenda plan, but it is not. Okay, so for June 22nd, 8 p.m. virtual, I have three things. Info, CMS EdSpec, Action, New Middle School Course, and Action Budget Priorities and Procedures. Yes, Ms. Hirsch? If we think there's gonna be significant conversation about anything other than central, can we maybe do it a little earlier? No, because of um, okay. Cody. You could start earlier or not. I could try to join and just be on mute. We could do the action items beforehand. Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm saying. I, <laughs> yes. So do you want to do 7 30? So if we could start it a little earlier, that would just be helpful. I just know it. Like I, I have. Are you guys going with 7 7 30? What's the bit ask here? Well, if he wants to be for, for central, we should just do it 7.30. Okay, so 7.30 virtual, June 22nd, okay? Although, I, no, 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 I have to, I, I, it, actually, it's a good point. I have to take a look, if we're not voting on central, I guess he could, there, there's some, I, I have to go back and read our policy as to having somebody join midway through a meeting but I don't think they can join just to vote. So we're not voting on it, so it's okay. Yeah, exactly right. That's fine. That's why, so if he misses the votes, it doesn't matter. And then right, can't. so then it's, so that's why I was just in my, yeah. It, it's midnight, my brain doesn't work that okay. well. All right, hour. got it. And then we'll have to have one meeting after that to just vote on the CMS ed spec, which that should be a 30 second hopefully meeting. Oh. Mother of God, okay. So, <laughs> anything? Ms. Costin, did she leave? She under the table? She left. We can't adjourn if she's not here. She under the table? Her computer's still here. 
No, her computer's here. So she's... Do we have to wait for her? No, no, no. I would like to make a motion. Let's do it. All right, Joe, you're back to your job. I'd like to make a motion. Oops, I have to do it here. I would like to make a motion to adjourn. Okay. Second, Second Michael Joseph. All in favor. That passes 7 0 because Miss Costin is not present. She did not vote. Miss Costin did not vote to end the meeting. <laughs>